and Uli Schoberra here. Um, I've known Uli for quite a few years. Uh, Uli is pretty much uh, a mad German inventor, uh, an innovator for power meters or uh, science and cycling. And as you probably all know, you know the, you know, the power meters really revolutionized the way that we think and we train uh, in cycling. Um, Uli wants me to share a little story. Um, I met Uli in 1997 for the first time. Uli brought across to the UK uh, when I worked at British Cycling uh, at Ergometers Power Meters, and we went for a ride on the, 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 the canal. And Uli was going so hard and so fast. Uh, I was on his wheel and on, I think it was a mountain bike, wasn't it? I think, I can't remember. But anyway, he was hammering along at 500 watts, and I jumped on the curb by the uh, by the canal um, to go straight in the canal and uh, much to Uli's amusement he thought I was pretending but no I sort of went straight head first into the, into the canal and then yeah all, all we heard was this mad German laugh which is he sort of stuck with me for years I think so um, anyway I'm glad I the source entertainment to Uli um, so uh, look without further ado um, we'll, I think we'll crack on so uh, I think we're going to do it's like a question, like a question and answer sort of session here. You know, we all going to ask you some questions, and then at the end we've got like five minutes for questions from the floor. Okay, so okay. show your appreciation and. Uh, so Yuli, good morning. <laughs> good morning, Nicholas. So I'm curious to know uh, how did the idea of building a parameter come up? Yeah, I was. Myself when I grew up in cyclist school, and when I went to university, I had less time for training. And I was at this time obsessed by the training to make the training as good as possible. And very early, I figured out you need to have the power to have the training proper because you train to increase your power, and you have the power values of your training. It makes it easier to make the training quality better, to see the quantity of the training and see the progress all over the year. And then it's independent from times, from other things. You have simple the power numbers. You follow up this over the year, then you see how much you get better by the training. So this was the idea. And um, you know, lately there's been a lot of uh, new power meters coming up on the market. And um, but still, it looks like SRAM have the the most teams in the peloton. Is there a particular reason to that? Yeah, and when I started first, I worked really close with the German Federation. This was from 1988 to the Olympic Games in Atlanta. I was responsible for the track mainly. Some also for the road, the 100 kilometer team time trial. And very early, um, at that time, good pros started using a power meter too. One of them was um, Greg Lemon, then later Bian Ries, and a lot of the Italian pros. And um, when I invented the power meter, I made a research where it's the best spot to measure the power. So firstly, I measured on the pedals, but this was not that good, it was too much exposed. Then I went to the cranks, and at the end, I ended up at the spot between the axle and the chain links. This is the same spot now where I'm measuring also quark and uh, power to max. And in my experience, this is the most reliable, the most serious spot to measure the power on the bike, and it's very well protected and um, it's easy, I think, to assemble on the bike. So again, the older the parts where you can measure, you can also measure on the rear wheel like um, the power tap is doing, but there's always a hassle to change the wheels. Um, earlier on, actually, um, I, I heard a story that I had no idea of. I didn't know you actually made parameters for other things than bicycles. Yeah. Very early at the start, um, I was invited to the university in Udine. There was a professor, Di Pramparo, his project was cycling in space. So his idea was to make the space station for the cosmonauts, because he worked for the Russian space station Mir, cycle every day. And he made calculations how fast they have to cycle in a ring with no gravity to create their own gravity. And then doing this in the space station, they train at that moment and they create <coughs> gravity all the muscles. And he, his research came up that says, okay, if you travel for two, three, four years in the space with no gravity, you will die. So you have to find a way to create your own gravity. And then working with um, the Pramparo at Budina, I met there all the other, at that time, fancy professors in Italy, like Conconi, Ferrari, Cecchini. They, they all were in that, that group. And so it was easy to spread out 
still the influence I have now with all the teams goes back to 25 years ago. Did we? Um, yeah. Was any other? Well, we can. Um, any other questions anybody got for for Uli? Well, we can start the questions now in terms of. There we go. Okay. So, how fast do you need to cycle in space? <laughs> um, it depends on the radius, and I think if you want at least one G. I think it's not that fast when the radius is short, but the, the bigger the radius is, the faster you have to cycle. And I think his idea was to have a space station with a diameter of about 20 meters. Then he made calculation that two or four or like equal that the uh, um, space station will not start toggling. So I think you can find something in the internet about this research. It was, for me, it was fascinating because then also they built the equipment for the space station with an SRMN. And this was basically the idea also to build an ergometer. So the idea came from this, and then later um, to build an ergometer, like as it is now, and together also with Peter Keen from at that time the University of Brighton, like the German Federation. What about, um, I know um, you've done a bit of work for America's Cup, haven't you? Yes. Things. Well, maybe you could tell us a little yeah, bit about um, that. Years ago we worked for America's Cup for three ships. One was the ship, um, Alengi, so Chalesu, the South African, and um, I think Luna Rossa. And they put power meters on the pedestals for the grinders to measure the performance. And interesting for me was that they need to push more than 800 watts with the arms to get up the sails up and down for about maybe eight or nine seconds. This was for them the qualification who can go on the ship. So they measured the performance of the grinders on pedestals. They made the standards are not on the ship, but also actually they put power meters on the pedestals on the ship. Okay. I've got another question about just where your company and how it evolved. I mean, when I first met Uli, and I'm sure that people have been over to, to Germany to see um, Uli's base, but when I first met you, you were making the cranks by hand in your cellar. Remember that? I came over yes. and you were down there like, hand making. So that's yeah. maybe. 88, 89. Yeah, but even 97, you're still, oh no, some, no. Yeah, you had two people working <coughs> downstairs, didn't you? And then you moved to the big factory. So yeah. what kind of drove do you think that, that kind of explosion in, um, in sales? And the explosion was slowly, it was a steady grow. A slow slowly, explosion. but steady grow. And um, the demand got higher and higher. But also um, our perspective to make power meters was to make a very reliable product. Still, we get power meters back for service. They are 20 years old. So, and we tried to make a very solid device that works flueless the whole year on the bike without any trouble. Yeah. This is what the, the idea behind. I think Nicolas Cantelli as he uses a power meter, the whole team uses. Yeah. And I think they're quite happy with this. Yeah. That'd be quite a good sort of segue into, so t tell us a bit about how you use power in, like, in your training and how maybe that's changed over time. Could you maybe tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. Um, I've been using now an SRAM device for the last five years. Started using it in 2009. And, um, you know, I, it's the greatest tool to get to know your yourself and to kind of search your, your limits as well. It's great to go back and analyze your data from year after year because then you can also know, uh, you know, maybe one day, you, you look at your number and you feel that the numbers are right and you're you know you're getting dropped anyway and I was like oh everyone's kind of caught up now you have to uh, work even harder again but um, you know even during a race you know like you're not looking at it uh, we we kind of have that direct analysis during the race but the device is well done that you can actually look up and you have all the essential information and you know also how you know and maybe it sounds pretty. Uh, simple, but you can actually, with the SRM you actually uh, sometimes provide from having a bunk or whatever because you can actually calculate with how much food, you know, if you come up to a climb you can think that, okay, if it's the middle of the race and you're going up for so many wattage, you might not need so much food if you're coming up to the last climb or second last climb and you know that <coughs> your wattage is going to go up, you're going to have a higher, much higher um, carry consumption yeah. and, you know, obviously you also know that uh, with the experience without the SRM, but Looking at it, it kind of you know when you're flat out on the bike, um, essentially all your energy and your thoughts are going to your legs and not through your brain. Yeah. But just having that quick snap and getting the information kind of brings you back to the to the to the analysis, you know, kind yeah. of thing and gives you a bit of, of a guideline. 
and uh, obviously through training, I think it's, uh, it's essential now to be the, a power meter. And I think, you know, um, most of the, the pro, but even now in the amateur uh, and juniors, and already from a young age, they use these power meters to, like I said, get to know each other and also kind of, once you know your limits, try and work on them and not to be like in a precise and right zone. Yeah. Uh, and so tell me, so in 2009, when you did it take you a while to get used to that different way of training? Because I think as we, we those of us that have power meters, it's, it's, it makes you really accountable because you know when you it doesn't let you slow down or you have to stay in you know like power zones. So did you find that challenging to get used to that different way of training, or was it just a natural thing for you to? No, there was a bit of a um, bit of an adapting time. Initially, it looked like a cool toy. And you know, you try it and you say, all right, today I'm going to do 20 minutes, 400 watts. You put your head down and just play with it, and then go home and analyze it yourself. Yeah. And then um, I'm doing two minutes at 400. I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> if, I'm but, uh, if I'm lucky at the moment. In fact, the first thing any average child says is also um, when you have a power meter. And I made a lot of error tests through the cyclists, but also the interesting is to know when you're in a break alone, you're pushing, let's say, 400 watts, doing 45, 50, and then a guy goes on here rear wheel you need less power too in the front. So you need around 30, 40 watts less to do the same speed, only having someone sitting on your wheel. And knowing this, sometimes when you're a bike, you know, okay, I have someone on the wheel, he's not even leading, but he helps me to go two kilometers faster, only when he sucks my wheel. Yeah. Is I knew this morning would be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell anybody else, yeah. Well, this is, this is yeah. why in a, in a team pursuit, for example, the third position is better than the fourth. When you're in a row yeah. four, the third one is the most economic one. And the last one has still the, the, the track from the circulation, but if someone on the wheel helps you. Yeah. And this is also when the car is behind you or a motorbike, this helps you tremendously to go faster. <coughs> and this is also when you look at calculations, some scientists do for climbs, it's difficult to see because there's still motorbikes around, other circumstances, and I think sometimes the calculation numbers are a little bit too high because they go faster by the drag, maybe they have less weight because at the end of the race they have two, three kilograms because they're totally dehydrated. And so it's also good to have a real power meter on the seat. This is the real number, what they're really doing, and not based by a calculation yeah. where you have some question marks, not some yeah. Yeah. numbers you don't know. Good, good point, good point. Okay. Any, any questions? Yeah. Um, so the SRM has focused on power only. Some others have focused on radial and tangential force. Why is that? Why? Why haven't you looked into the, the What was forces? the other way you, you asked? So SRM only focuses on power, but what about the, the tangential and the radial forces? Why haven't you looked into that? The torque, you mean the torque? No, the actual forces on the crank. And no, on the we pedal. had a pedal that measured the tangential and the radial forces, but this is only for the ergometer, not for outside. Mm -hmm. For outside, I came, I said power is fine because on the bike, you, ha you cannot need too much feedback because you have to focus on the road and it's I think for training power heart rate speed time cadence is enough but for the ergometer in the laboratory it's nice to have all other values like oxygen uptake then um, all, all the forces on the pedals left and right side separated and all this but I think on the bike also for the daily training power is enough and this is my, my philosophy what I think is it's even difficult in us to make a proper training only with this power, heart rate, and cadence and time. Mr. Passer, <coughs> there's been some talk of um, you displaying power output from riders on television during racing. Yes. I wonder what you think of that. We did this in the year, um, the first time, 1999, of Tour of Germany, with Z1. <coughs> also with a camera on the bike, and the camera was sending right away the signals to the helicopter and only by T-Mobile because no other team wanted to ride but T-Mobile as a sponsor wanted to push this and also we did four years to the cross with telemetry but mainly T-Mobile riders but it, at that time the camera was, was very heavy and the demand was to have a live picture a live stream picture from the bike for the TV coverage and I spoke yesterday with Shimano what they are doing I think is, is nice for people to see pictures from inside but this is recorded and showed after. So it's not live because also they said it will suck too much battery. And even what you have now on the bike <coughs> runs for two hours. So you can only run it for two hours and the batteries are empty. So the cyclist has to select start or stop. But I think maybe in 10 years, 
I think the scene in cycling will be in Formula One that on each bike is a little sender device with everything with GPS. And I think some organizations like ASO will demand <coughs> to get this from one or two from the team to make the racing even more interesting. Like what's Formula One that demands from every Formula One team that they have to provide a certain amount of data from each car. But I understand that each cyclist wants to keep the secret of this, I understand. But I think if you say, okay, I don't show my head right, I show a little bit power every fifth stage, maybe this is not that big of a problem. I think more problem is if someone observes your old training, sees how you train, and then what comes out. This is, I think, the secret. But one shot of one stage tells you nothing how you get there. What do you think, uh, Nicholas? Would you like someone to see your power live in a, on television? Would, would, would that be a concern to you? Well, um, actually, to, to go back with you, what you just said, uh, I've shared a fair bit of data over the last few years now with, uh, with SRM on just like he spotted on yeah. the terminal stages. Um, actually, the stage that I won on the Vuelta that was put up on, yeah. on the internet uh, the next day. I, I agree with the fact that if you sh share um, occasionally the, the data on the stage, there's no, you know, there's, you're not giving away how you train. Yeah. And or you've got to go and do the training. Oh, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I think, I, me as a cyclist, I would not show all my training because this is the secret. What interval training or what is your yeah. preparation? And that's also why you pay a coach to have yeah. your kind of yeah. your secret. secrecy and you work together yeah. and you think of new training and you know it'd be a shame to give it away yeah. to, to everyone. Yeah. And, okay. and, and then also, he wouldn't do this too, I think. Mm -hmm. Soccer to make secret training, no cameras allowed, and they do their training and they do not want to share this with the public, but then when it's the soccer game, all is for the public. They make analyzing and see how many meters each was running. Yeah, mm -hmm. but not the training. Okay. Any other? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. What do you feel about the accuracy of the new stages power meter? Obviously, only measuring at the left. Right. I would not call this a power meter because <laughs> 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 it has a definition what is power, and power is the, torque, the average torque per revolution multiplicated with the angular velocity. And if you measure only the half torque, you do not know what is the other leg is doing. If you have a cyclist only with one leg, what, what comes out? It's the same like when I measure your weight and you step with one leg on a scale and I multiplicate this by two. Then I say, this is your weight. You can make up every number you want. So not very accurate, I would say. <laughs> One. Some of the other versions, the SRM, required it to be sent back to have the battery replaced. What was your reason for maintaining that when your competitors were actually allowing the users to actually replace their own batteries? No, we, we work on new power meters where the battery is in the axle. Customers can replace. Easy. We have now on the market an FSA model. And there will come some other models. We will also have some models with a rechargeable battery. But also, if you see now at a power meter, Actually, they run almost up to 3,000 hours. And I think after 3,000 hours of use, it's maybe nice to have the system service <coughs> calibrated. So it's not every 300 hours we talk about two or 3,000 hours. This is for the most, even for a professional cyclist, two years. And for the most of the cyclists, it's five or six years. But we will have power meters where the customer can, uh, where the user can replace the battery at his own, if he wants. <coughs> One of the problems from the transition from uh, wired SRM and uh, wireless SRM was the interference from TV motor during the race. Yeah, the problem is the ANT. It's the same frequency. So the, the TV camera on the motor, or on the several TV cameras they send to a helicopter, send on the same frequency as the ANT. And they are sending so strong that all the signals on the bike get destroyed. But the older systems with the cable, they were this was no problem for them. But all ANT sensors have this problem. This is not a, an SRM problem. It is an ANT problem yeah. that we, I, this is not what I can change. Uh, yeah, to go back to the wire. If there are not the solutions. Okay, wire is easier, you know, when you have a wireless phone or you go with a wireless phone on a computer, you hear sometimes a noise, this is, and this is why, why, why I still think Shimano has the shifting system not wireless, they have it by cable. And this is more safe. <coughs> yeah. And maybe you have to, but 
the, the camera, the TV camera sends so strong that I think it's not easy to have something that is assistant against this. It's a real problem for all the, all kind of performance analysts. If you if you try to to analyze the files and yes. you, and you you have a hole in the data, just throw it away. You cannot do anything. Okay, but then you have to say no TV cameras. <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> so go back to the wire, please. <laughs> you can still fit a wire, can't you? Though you can still cheat. Uh, we have power meters that run by wire, but then you have to use all the power control. Yeah. Yeah. But. Okay, this is possible, but I think 99% of the customers will not want this. Maybe some scientists, I'm not sure. You, you know that when the camera comes, yeah. The, yeah, yeah. is this a problem for you? Especially on the, well, I mean, on, on the final climb, yeah. it, the goal is to follow the guy in front of you, so we're not looking at it, but I agree that on the analyst side, when you go back to the hotel or in the evening, you like to discuss with your coach, okay, how well did I go on the, regardless of your position, just for the next time. And that I agree that we lose that precious data because sometimes maybe your 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 <coughs> best performance was done on that time and, and you don't really know about it. Mm. Uh, mm. It's an issue. It is, but um, it be it's only for that last couple of minutes. Mm. For the crucial, okay. the crucial couple of minutes. Yeah. We'll just move on. We've got two more minutes. John, actually, following on from that, it strikes me that one thing. <coughs> It, would it be possible, do you think the miniaturization is there, to split the downloadable system so that you could store the data locally in the, in the device and download direct from the crank so you're not transmitting out? So yes. that then becomes a wired hub. But, but the way how we measure the power is with the zero of the calibration, it requires also the speed. Mm -hmm. Because the head unit needs to know is the bike in motion or not. Mm -hmm. And the power meter alone doesn't know this. And this is a problem. And also the power meter, our power meter provides the torque and the angular velocity, yeah. but the torque, the raw torque data, mm -hmm. and not the calculated power. But I agree, it's, it's possible to make something, but then it's difficult that the speed sensor speaks with the power meter, because this is needed to make an outer zero calibration. Okay. I, I can explain <laughs> <think laughs> <of laughs> <how laughs> <it laughs> <is laughs> so about uh, I'm always very interested in the process you use for calibrating SRM. For, for, for what? Calibrating, recalibration, or checking the, checking the calibration. Um, the simple calibration is you have a weight and you hang on the chain. Mm. Right. And then you take um, the both spots when you have the highest torque. This is when the crank is horizontal. And then you, you see left and right side if it's equal. Then um, you make a calibration with two or three different weights, and then you see is the slope really a slope or is this a curve? Do you do that for both chain rings? Yes, yeah. and then with different weights, and then um, both sides. Right. So, so three point you do three weights on each chain yeah. ring, on, and yeah. and then average between the two. Yeah, but normally left and right is measured equal. Right. Okay. And this is under the two person tolerance. What we, what we claim, maybe the most power meters are better than one person. But if we claim it's better than one person, then some is maybe 1.5. It's better to say better than two person. But more important is the constancy, that every power meter all over the year provides the constant data. And it's not today two person up, tomorrow two person below, because they already have a deviation of, of four person. Okay. One more question, but it's got to be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> so no pressure. <laughs> Okay, it's, it's quite a technical question. So, it's, uh, how do you measure angular velocity of the cranks? Right now, we measure the two spots, uh, two spots the, the time. In the future, we will measure on eight spots inside. I was just wondering, what, is there any reason for not using kind of uh, gyroscope technology that's pretty cheap now? We, we tried, but it was not that easy. It's okay. still better with read switches. Okay, I just because I know saying in track cycling something when the forces are very high but angular velocity is very low, you're kind of limiting your resolution of measurement there, aren't you? No, but still we measure the, the torque 500,000 times per second. But not the angular velocity though, only at two points on revolution. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And right now on two points per revolution, okay. yes. Mm. Yeah. All right. Look, I think we'll. I think it's about 9.30, so I'd just like to say thanks very much and good luck.